Many times we need to keep our health in check, but don't know what questions to ask or where to begin. We walk in blindly to our health care provider and walk out none the wiser and maybe even more confused than before. Can you take charge of your health and arm yourself with the questions and preparedness you need? The answer is yes. Welcome to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. This program will answer your questions and give you the best practices for facing your medical partner in good health. Now, here's Dr. Susan Downs. Hello, this is Occupy Health with Dr. Susan. We had many experts talking on diet and lifestyle changes. You will hear many more experts talk about specific diets. Which one is for you? Does one size fit all? Unfortunately, I think the answer to that will be no, as our current guest will explain. Diets need to be tailored to the individual needs. A particular diet might quell the fire that is generating path toward chronic diseases, but it might not stop that progression toward the chronic disease. So today, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is a board-certified chiropractic neurologist through the American Chiropractic Neurology Board, and he's a fellow of the American College of Functional Neurology. He specializes in neurodegenerative and child development disorders. He earned his diplomat status through the International College for Applied Kinesiology. He earned his Doctorate of Chiropractic degree from Northwestern Health Sciences University. He's been speaking internationally on topics of applied kinesiology and functional medicine since 2008. He's also the founder of the Atlas Institute, a nonprofit organization that educates the public on nutritional concepts and controversies. He has an office in Fairfax, California, and he's opening a healthy restaurant in Fairfax as well. But more interesting, he's setting up the delivery service of individual food to people within the San Francisco Bay Area. I know I certainly want to sign up for that. He's also an expert in nutrition and neuroendocrine immunology. For each patient, he sets up an individual plan with a unique diet as one uh, size does not fit all. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for coming on the show. Hey, Susan. Thank you for having me. Yes. Well, let's get started. We're covering food sensitivities, and a lot of doctors are talking about food sensitivities. What is it? What is a food sensitivity? Well, a food sensitivity is a situation where a person eats their food normally, and instead of just digesting and absorbing it and turning it into something healthy for themselves, they actually develop a, an immune reaction to it, and it becomes something like pro-inflammatory that can make them very sick. Yes, I recall from various speakers that when you get an inflammatory situation, it can spur on just about every disease. Yes, unfortunately, once this starts happening, um, every known condition can be accelerated, and, and particularly in chronic conditions and neurodegenerative disease. How does this happen? How does it turn into this ball of fire? Well, the way it works is uh, normally we eat proteins and they go into our stomach and there are these big boluses of food and we're supposed to break them down into the, the individual components called amino acids, fats, and carbohydrates. And what ends up happening is um, the first step in the development of a food sensitivity is that protein is not broken down into individual amino acids or building blocks. There's like chunks of protein that are still stuck together and they go into the small intestine and through various mechanisms, that chunk of protein ends up having contact with white blood cells that surround the small intestine and that local inflammatory response becomes systemic as soon as the heart beats. So, uh, Dr. O'Brien in the past talked about gluten um, resulting in clumps of food because he said gluten cannot be digested by the human. So these clumps of food work their way through the small intestines, and then they set up an inflammatory reaction. How does that happen? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of different mechanisms there, but say, for example, the, the food gets broken down impartially into these chunks of food, and so now this this can be recognized by the immune system. Now, there's something called the gut associated lymphatic tissue that surrounds 
the small intestine, the large intestine. It's about 70% of our immune system. And what ends up happening is there are various things that can cause a breakdown between the lining of the intestine and our white blood cells or the gut sociopathic tissue. One of the things that can cause that breakdown are lectins. Um, lectins are proteins that are found in grains and nightshades and eggs and in nuts, for example. And these lectins, the most popular one or the most talked about one is gluten, and it can bind to the inside of the intestine kind of like gum when it gets stuck on a sweater. When you pull the gum off the sweater, there's some sweater on the gum and there's some gum on the sweater, right? So the, what happens is, is a, a lectin just by itself that isn't digested all the way will bind to the inside of the intestine. The body will have to pry that off the inside of the intestine so they can absorb food. That creates a little hole in the intestines and that creates an avenue by which now the immune system can have contact with the protein and that protein doesn't belong in the blood undigested and so now the immune system has to deal with it. It creates an inflammatory response which then perpetuates so many conditions and very, very quickly people with autoimmunity can start to go downhill. So let me understand this. Certain foods kind of clump to the sides of the intestine uh, somehow or other that has gotten a, has to be taken off the wall of the intestine, leaving a hole. And with that hole there, all sorts of nasty, um, undesirable proteins go into the blood system? Exactly. And, and that's what happens with lectins in particular. The scary thing is that a person can eat really healthy food like um, steak, for example, or chicken that does not have lectins. But if they don't break that protein all the way down, and that food goes into the small intestine, but the person develops leaky gut uh, or the holes in the intestine from uh, a dysbiosis or an imbalance of the normal microflora in the small intestine or, say, a thyroid issue or um, they've had a concussion recently or if they have other factors like um, Lyme disease that are ravaging their body or chronic stress or acute stress that is bringing blood away from their intestines, that lining can break down from the inside out, not necessarily because of the food, but if the food isn't broken down all the way, they will still develop a food sensitivity. So let me see if I can understand this. There seems to be two processes involved. There's many things such as environmental, bad diet, stress, poor sleep, uh, poor nutrition that can lead to a, a permeable or leaky gut with holes so things can go out in the wrong direction. But there also sounds like, for some reason, some of our food is not being totally broken down into the little chunks of amino acids, and you've got these clumps, as you say. So there's... So those are two different ways that we can get to this inflammatory response? Yep. So the the, the thing that has to happen, that's exactly it. The thing that has to happen to develop um, a food sensitivity is incomplete breakdown of protein. That's the first thing. The second thing that has to happen is the immune system has to have contact with that undigested protein. Now, what's really interesting is that a person with a healthy lining of their intestines, they do not have any leaky gut whatsoever, can still develop this food reaction because there's a type of cell in the gut associated back tissue called the dendritic cell, and it's kind of like an octopus. It has these long tentacles, and it can actually reach from the blood or the gut associated lymphatic tissue into the lumen of the intestine, and it can, it can sense this undigested protein, and it will give like a thumbs down saying that it doesn't like it, and that cell can present antigens to the rest of the immune system and create a systemic inflammatory response without having any leaky gut. Okay, so and let me... And it can actually s- cause leaky gut from that. Okay, so leaky gut we can trigger probably in hundreds of different ways, but just looking at food not being broken into the chunks of amino acids it's supposed to be in, that alone can cause problems. So why is our food not being totally broken down to amino acids as it should be? Yeah, and so the the number one reason that we would consider is something called hyperchlorhydria, which means low stomach acid production. And there are so many, so many mechanisms. Some of the most common are hypothyroidism or a functional hypothyroidism. There, there are 24 patterns of thyroid disturbance in the literature, and anything that will impair thyroid function can do that. Anything that takes blood away from the stomach. So when we become stressed, the blood moves from our internal organs to our shoulders and hips so that we can fight or flee. 
when that happens, the blood leaves our internal organs and we really are inefficient in digestion and absorption at that time. And so that can create low stomach acid. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve that comes out of the brain stem and that integrates with the stomach and, and basically gives the neurological signal for it to heal but also to produce stomach acid. So a breakdown in any of those systems can create low stomach acid. A person can drink too much water with their meal or too much wine or too much soda and that can produce low stomach acid. We can have infections in our stomach like H. pylori that's normally supposed to be there can overgrow and that can create low stomach acid. So part of a resolution in a food sensitivity case will be identifying where is this low stomach acid issue coming from. Interesting. It's a lot, it's a lot more complex than just giving some glutamine to heal the leaky gut. And really what ends up happening is, is the key issue that ends up happening is this immune reactivity to the food is actually called a loss of oral tolerance. And this loss of tolerance is really the key thing. And this loss of tolerance to foods ends up becoming a loss of tolerance to our own tissue, which is called autoimmunity. And it can cause a loss of tolerance to chemicals. So we can start reacting to our environment like um, carpets and, and cigarette smoke and exhaust make us sneeze, and we can also react to our environment like um, pollens and molds and things like that, and, and some of that can be secondary to this loss of tolerance, which can come from food. Well, oh, so let me see if I can summarize this. Low stomach acid can be caused by many different things, low thyroid stress, uh, imbalance with the vagus nerve, but this leads to clumps of food getting into our blood system, which leads to an autoimmune reaction within our body, maybe thyroiditis or multiple sclerosis. And this could lead to sensitivity uh, to just about anything in our environment, including carpets and upholstery, et cetera? Correct. And it works other ways. The person can have a loss of chemical tolerance. Uh, say they work uh, in retail and they're around clothes that are constantly off-gassing. The, the, the chemicals that are used for dry cleaning and so on, and they can develop a food sensitivity secondary to a loss of chemical tolerance. Wow. So as we get older, we might get more of these sensitivities which feed on each other, increase the inflammation, and increase this cascade even more so. Yeah, there become more loops of neurodegeneration and, and disease that start to pick up loss of function, and uh, it becomes an acceleration of the aging process, Absolutely. Wow. Well, I mean, I know these doctors are very fond of giving us antacids to decrease our stomach acid. Uh, how does, I mean, that sounds like it's only going to make the problem worse. Yeah, so what happens is uh, in heartburn, in a lot of cases, not every case, but for the sake of our discussion and a person that's having low stomach acid, um, they may eat protein and like a, a hamburger or something that goes in their stomach and because their stomach acid is low, they don't break the protein down completely, and that food starts to putrefy and ferment and rot in the stomach, and it produces its own acid, and those acids irritate the lining of the stomach, and, and that will create a uh, situation where they may have acid reflux, you know, the body is giving a signal. Uh, sometimes that's due to an uh, actual high stomach acid issue where a person is, is having acid reflux, but often... Acid reflux is secondary to low stomach acid and it's rotting of food. So that the antacid, either the prescribed or the over-the-counter like Tums, can help relieve the symptoms in the moment, but it really doesn't do anything to address the underlying issue, which is the lining of the stomach is not producing enough acid to actually digest the food. Isn't another problem as well as with low stomach acid, you're not going to generate the pancreatic enzymes, which are needed further to break down these clumps. So having low stomach acid and taking antacids is only going to make this whole chain of events worse? Well, it becomes a big issue, absolutely, because now the stomach acid is not uh, acidic enough as it leaves the, the stomach into the small intestine. And there needs to be a certain pH in the small intestine to trigger, like you said, the pancreas and the gallbladder to do its job. So now what we have is a lack of digestion and a lack of absorption. And then we have more bacteria in our bowel than we have cells in our body that are waiting for this perfect digestion and absorption. And when we don't get it, now they get to eat our food or our undigested food. 
And instead of producing really good, healthy things for us, that microflora now can get imbalanced and produce really nasty, toxic things. So now, in addition to a loss of immune tolerance of our own white blood cells, we have thousands and millions of cells in our colon and our small intestine that are producing inflammatory things, and it, it becomes insult to injury. So what do we do when the doctor says we need to take antacids? Well, I think that we need to identify why does the person have a problem with stomach acid production, or is that actually the issue? And there needs to be a systematic way of evaluating a person to figure out, is it a hormonal thing? Is it a thyroid thing? Is it insulin? Is it cortisol? Is it um, a neurological thing? Is there an infection? And we kind of go through this list of things, and, and the reality is, is the most complex cases, they have many of these things. They have more than one. And so they may have one or two addressed, and it, as it turns out, they don't feel any better because they still have two or three to go. And then they go and see a doctor that focuses on those two or three to go, but then by that time, the first two may have already come back. And so it be- becomes very difficult unless the person they're seeing is, is well-rounded and versed in all these different systems so they can take yeah. a comprehensive look. Wow. Well, we're coming to a break now, so we will come back, learn about this and more uh, after the break. Think you've seen everything there is to see in online television? Let us surprise you. Visit voiceamerica.tv today for sports, health, business, and more on demand 24-7. Are you a pet parent? Are you interested in a better understanding of the care and health of your best friend? Listen every week for Pet Panorama with Dr. Julie Mayer. Just as in your own personal health care, you can also take charge of the health care of your pet by exploring natural approaches to keep them healthy in addition to more conventional veterinary care. Don't you want them having the best life possible? Listen Fridays at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health & Wellness. We all have challenges each and every day. How do you relax and live in a calm state? On Chaos to Calm, we introduce you to the concept of Ren Shui, a path to feeling calmer and happier. Listen Mondays at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health & Wellness. Sometimes it just seems that nobody understands. There's one individual who can help. If you're living with somebody who faces challenges such as autism, Asperger's, or other exceptional needs, you'll want to tune into Solutions and Strategies with Dr. Sean. Living the Challenge. Together, we'll uncover a variety of solutions to the challenges faced by individuals, their families, and teachers. Listen live every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, on Voice America Health & Wellness. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. We'd love to hear from you about today's show. Send your email to Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. That's Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Well, welcome back to Occupy Health. Well, we learned that it's very important to keep our stomach acid up, and it's very important that we totally digest our food. Otherwise, we go down this path of having all these unwanted clumps go into our system, an autoimmune reaction, inflammation, and that, I think, leads us down the path to most chronic diseases. So talking about food sensitivity, what's the difference between food sensitivity and a food allergy? Oh, that's a great question. Um, So... When the immune system or the white blood cells have contact with that protein, it can make different types of what are called antibodies, which are just chemicals that will bind to that tissue so that other white blood cells can come by and take care of them. And um, a typical allergy, like a peanut allergy or a shellfish allergy, is something totally different. And that's what's called an IgE-mediated response, which means there's there's a special tag that gets put on that food. So have you ever seen a, one of those trees that has an X on it, okay, and the, arbor, the arborist has to come by and cut down that tree? 
Um, there could be orange X's, there could be green X's. And so there's different types of antibodies that we can make. And in a true allergy, it's what's called an IgE response. And that person will tend to require an EpiPen or some emergency type medicine to help them in that scenario. That's not the majority of what we see in our practice because people are very aware of what they're already allergic to. What a sensitivity is, is what's called an IgG mediated response or an IgA mediated, which means a different color X, as it were, was put on that food. And there's more of a either mucosal at the level of the skin of the inside of the intestine or a bloodborne response that can become systemic from those two. So uh, the uh, allergy is an immediate reaction. It happens immediately, like bee stings and see people with peanut allergies, and they carry along the EpiPen so they can have immediate relief and it can be lethal. But it sounds like the food sensitivity is kind of a slow smoldering that we might not even know that there's an X on us. Yeah, it looks a lot like chronic fatigue. It looks like a lot like insomnia. It can look like depression. It can look like chronic pain that isn't going away. It can look like digestive disturbance or acid reflux. It can basically contribute to every condition that we might seek out an over-the-counter remedy or a specialist to deal with that one thing. But really what it is is it's a chronic inflammatory response mediated by this immune system. What are the most common foods that will lead to such sensitivities? Well, certainly the, the one that gets the most talk in the literature um, and on chat boards is, is gluten. And uh, we have a particularly difficult time breaking down that gluten protein. So it can tend to bind to the intestine and just by itself create an inflammatory response. What are some of the other ones to look out for? You know, there's a, there's a lot of questioning about how genetically modified food plays into this whole thing. And certainly... Grains that have been um, fried or altered in some way to increase their shelf life, um, things that are not organic, what ends up happening is the chemical in that pesticide will bind to the protein in that food, and now that protein is no longer recognizable to us by the body. So what ends up happening is, is if our immune system sees one of those proteins in partially broken down, which, by the way, are our stomach can't really break down those proteins very well, then they pretty much automatically become an antigen or something that will kick off this entire inflammatory response. Also, anything with food coloring on it can have the same effect. Wow. So what we eat certainly is giving messages to our body and stirring up lots of problems in terms of inflammation. Absolutely. Food can be our best friend or our worst enemy. But aren't some of the most common foods that people have sensitivity to, things like corn and dairy and soy, are there others that are very common? Well, you know, the interesting thing about corn and dairy and soy is, you know, sometimes it's not so much that the body is reacting to the corn protein or the dairy protein or the soy protein. There's a concept in in this immunological field called molecular mimicry, which is for people that maybe are gluten sensitive or maybe they have uh, Hashimoto's, for example, which is a a thyroid autoimmunity, they may think that corn and soy and dairy proteins are actually gluten or they may mistake corn and dairy and soy protein as the enzyme and the thyroid that they're after. So they don't even really have a sensitivity to those foods in particular but through the concept of molecular mimicry, they misidentify these proteins and attack them mistakenly, which creates the same inflammatory response. So how can we find out what foods are generating these reactions in us? You know, I, the favorite lab that I like to use for the majority of my food testing is a lab called Cyrex. And um, what I like about Cyrex is they do both IgG and IgA, which is blood and mucosal-mediated immune responses. But they also look at cooked versus non-cooked because we can develop food sensitivities versus that. They also look at bits of food. So they have one test which is really interesting where they look at the wheat berry as a complex. And then as we start to break down wheat in our stomach, what will happen is it breaks down into these chunks of protein we talked about before it gets into amino acids. Remember, the chunks of protein are what we react to, not the amino acids. And so some people don't react to wheat as a group, 
but they'll start to react to some of these chunks of protein, like, for example, a gliadin or what's called an agglutinin or something called a gluteomorphin, which is the addictive portion of the wheat berry. And so that test is, is very useful in determining, hey, maybe they don't react to all of wheat, but they react to parts of the wheat berry. And so they really may take a, a test from another lab that looks at wheat as one whole substance, but they're actually reacting to only part of the wheat. And so they may take a, a test with another lab and they're, they're told they're good, but in reality, they're not good. In fact, every time they eat it, they're perpetuating their neurodegenerative disease or autoimmunity or, or whatever else they're dealing with. So the doctor's test for the anti-gliadin antibody to see if you're sensitive to gluten or not does not tell the whole story. You need to look at the antibodies toward the other parts of gluten, which you can do through Cyrix Labs. Yeah, they have an array called Array 3, which is really amazing for that. It's the only lab that I know of that's that comprehensive for wheat and gluten in specific. Okay. But you also said that people might not have these sensitivities and the body might mistake the wheat for, you know, the enzyme in the thyroid or, the you know, the islet cells in the pancreas or the Purkinje cells, the balanced cells in the brain. So do these people have a sensitivity or not? Well, the reality is, is that a person could have, for example, Epstein-Barr virus and because of that, their immune system gets confused and just starts attacking all sorts of stuff. And it may not even be an acute phase of the virus. It may be a chronic phase of the virus. And so a person could show up with positive antibodies to specific food that they, they may never have eaten before. For example, on one of the panels that I run through Cyrex, they test different spices like paprika. And some people will swear they've never had paprika, but they have a very strong reaction to it on this lab. And to me, that always suggests that there's, definitely more going on than just a food problem. There's a systemic issue that's basically dovetailing and creating a, a, a more exaggerated response. So this lab will pick up all of these? Well, the lab is, is it can, yeah. The thing about lab testing is um, before we do a lab test, we need to make sure that there's going to be a, a low probability of false negatives and false positives. The lab is very good. Um, some people, their immune system is so depleted that when you run antibody testing to look and see the immune system is functioning, attacking other foods or, or tissue, they can't even generate a strong enough response to show up on a lab test. So before we run antibody testing for foods, uh, it makes sense to look at things like immunoglobulin counts to make sure that you're not going to get a false negative because the immune system is so depleted from, out, from reacting for so long that they can't even generate a response that would show up positive on a test. So that's the SIGA test. It's a total immunoglobulin test because we're looking for IgA, IgG as well. Okay. Uh, some questions. So if, if somebody has a sensitivity to gluten, is just removing gluten from the diet enough? Well, that's a great, that's a really good question. And that's, that really brings us back to oral tolerance. And, and so the answer is no. In fact, if a person has a sensitivity to gluten and their only strategy is to avoid gluten, what will end up happening is they'll have a honeymoon phase where they feel better because gluten is actively causing their system to break down and become immunologically compromised or reactive. But taking away gluten, which is kind of like the arson that's burning the house down, doesn't cause the house to repair necessarily. And so usually people, when they take away gluten, will start eating something else. And anything that the protein doesn't get broken down completely that has contact with either a dendritic cell through a healthy intestine, which is overreactive due to various mechanisms, or has contact with the other immune system due to a leaky gut, can now perpetuate that same response. And so this is what we see happening, Susan, is that people will come into our office and they started out gluten-free, dairy-free, and over the course of months or years, they gradually got less and less and less and less foods that they could actually tolerate because they just restricted their diet more and more and more and more. And that food restriction is helpful in the short term relieving inflammation, but in the long term actually can create uh, or exacerbate this oral lack of oral tolerance, which will basically perpetuate this entire process. So are you saying if we eat a lot of any particular thing and if we don't digest it totally, which sounds like can happen, then we're going to go down the same path, and there could be fewer and fewer foods we can eat with a shrinking menu in the future? Yeah, what I'm saying is if somebody eats 
gluten, and they develop a loss of oral tolerance to food because of that, and they avoid gluten, that's a great first step. Now, that's for a food sensitivity. For a person with celiac disease, they absolutely need to avoid gluten. That's not something that um, would be bad for them in any way long-term to do that. But for a person with a food sensitivity, if they avoid that food and that food contributes to a loss of oral tolerance and the oral tolerance persists, the lack of oral tolerance persists, they will just develop antibodies to whatever isn't completely broken down in that protein store we talked about earlier. So they'll just avoid one food, they'll eat another food and feel better because they're not reacting to it right away, but over the course of weeks and months, they start reacting to those new foods, and because of that, the oral tolerance never was addressed, and they just perpetuate that response and get sicker and sicker while initially they feel better. So Dr. O'Brien was saying in a previous show that gluten is just like putting fire into the system, but it sounds like anything eventually can put that we develop a sensitivity to can put fire in the system. And so we can, you know, stop the arsonist and take out the immediate fire. But it sounds like it's very important that we fix the oral tolerance as well as the permeability of the intestine. Otherwise, this process is never going to end. Absolutely. And the, the thing is, is, that's the biggest mistake, I believe, a, a clinician and a patient can make is to say, wow, I'm sensitive to these foods and I should avoid them. And that's all they do. Because what will end up happening is that does not solve the oral tolerance puzzle. And they will end up having a honeymoon phase of feeling better. But over time, we've just seen it now. I've been in practice for 14 years, and I've seen it, where people just feel better right away, and over time, they just get worse and worse and worse, and now they don't tolerate anything by the time they come back in. They're just not tolerating any foods at all, and at that point, it's not even the food anymore. There's just so many factors that we have to deal with that, you know, we have to start identifying each one of those and and, and solving them. Wow. So uh, we've only got about a minute or so before the break. So it sounds like we need to address the oral tolerance. So, you know, let's start on that a little bit, and then we'll cut off to a break. So what do we do about the oral tolerance? So the first step in oral tolerance is, is to identify foods that might be intolerable to our body. That, that's very important, okay? And that's where most people start and end. And so what we can figure out next is how do we identify the other variables that are contributing to loss of oral tolerance and start remediating them. And what is oral tolerance before we get to the break? Oral tolerance means that the immune system is not reacting to the food that is going in there, basically. So the food goes in, it gets digested perfectly, and the immune system does not identify it as a threat, or the food goes in doesn't digest perfectly, but the immune system still doesn't react to it. It just ignores it. That's oral tolerance. Well, it sounds pretty good. If the immune system's not going to react to our food, uh, then we won't get all these immune reactions. Uh, However, we are coming to a break now. So uh, we'll get back uh, to discuss this and more things after the break. You are listening to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. We'd love to hear from you about today's show. Send your email to Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. That's Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back to Occupy Health. I think I just heard Dr. Smith tell us that uh, the oral um, tolerance means that we're not reacting to the food that goes down our system. So isn't that a good thing if we're not generating an autoimmune reaction to our foods and we're not setting these fires throughout our intestines? Absolutely. I think the goal of any uh, immune case that I would see, or autoimmune case, or my goal as a clinician, one of them is to make sure that we can do everything in our ability to have them have the ability to have oral tolerance. And if they are demonstrating lack of oral tolerance, then we need to remediate that. Okay, because that's setting the fires all over the place. Okay, so uh, what do we do about this uh, oral intolerance? Well, the first thing is is, is certainly if if there's a list of foods that are um, 
definitely causing the person to react, then they need for a period of time to avoid them. But then we need to take a look at the rest of the system. So the first thing we need to understand is that the breakdown in protein is vital. So that person needs to have a systemic workup where they look at these different factors like thyroid function, 24 patterns of thyroid disturbance. They need to have their their nervous system evaluated to see do they have a problem developmentally or neurodegeneratively, have they had an injury to their brain that's causing their vagus nerve to not get the job done or something along what's called a diastatic communication between the vagus nerve area in the medulla and other aspects of the brain. We need to understand that um, a person that anything that's going to cause an increase in cortisol or insulin can perpetuate or cause this. So we need to do a really good job as clinicians, be well-rounded. We need to have good forms that can help us be efficient. We need to be able to order labs and interpret them properly. And we need to be able to systematically identify variables that are contributing to this low stomach acid issue, which perpetuate, which kick off this problem. And then any concomitants that result from the lack of function. Initially, okay. it's just low stomach acid or lack of digestion. And that can come from a number of things. And that comes back in the history as well. But as we start to fix this issue, depending on how long it's there and how many systems now have become involved and started to break down, we need to identify each one of those systems and create a therapy or an intervention that will address them so that they can actually tolerate those foods again. Ultimately, we want people to eat more foods and not less foods. That's the so- what I hear you saying is these systems are so interconnected, like uh, when you talked about insulin, it means we need to make sure our sugars stay stable, don't go too high or too low. We need to make sure our thyroid's balanced. The cortisol, we need to, you know, maintain, you know, minimize our stress and sleep well. So this is all interconnected, and we've got to take a systematic view to finding out what's causing our lack of oral tolerance are not uh, reacting well to our foods. It's not just a diet. Absolutely, and that's why people will feel better when they go on a diet initially, but eventually can be much worse and have more food sensitivities and end up back where they started, but with a smaller list of foods they can eat. And that's why we need to look at these other systems, absolutely. Very complicated. Now, one thing of interest to me is the brain. So since uh, the gut interacts closely with the brain, if we've got oral intolerance and then we're reacting poorly to our food, how does that affect our brain? Well, that's a great question. We have, we've been le- learning a lot out there about the gut-brain connection. We have this brain-gut connection as well. But anytime we have a local inflammatory response in the intestines, as soon as the heart beats, that becomes systemic, okay? And that local issue also can go to the liver and to the other lymph nodes and create systemic immunolo- immunological problems, okay? And so... Eventually, if that goes on long enough and it's severe enough, there's a part of the brain called the blood-brain barrier that can break down, and now these food antigen particles can start going directly into our brain, and the white blood cells in the brain, called the glial cells, now instead of being primed for neural growth and neural protection, get primed or ramified, it's called, to neurodegenerative processes and can contribute to things like depression or brain fog or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, um, Alzheimer's, any, every known neurodegenerative problem now can be accelerated by this. Now, I understand these microglial cells, once they get their act going, it's really hard to stop them. Yeah, once a microglial cell gets ramified, there's a process by which it can come back. Um, however, in the case of concussions, for example, uh, a microglial cell may stay ramified for up to three weeks and then reset. That second concussion it will take longer, and there's some evidence that after a third concussion, the microglial cells never come back. They just stay. They will stay there, and they will continue to promote neurodegenerative disease once they're in that state. Now, once we have a leaky gut, doesn't that usually extend to having leaky brain? So all sorts of unpleasant things can go into our brain. Absolutely, and, and that's, that's what I was mentioning with the blood-brain barrier. That systemic inflammatory response can break down the blood-brain barrier, and that's a pretty nasty scenario where there's a rapid acceleration of neurodegeneration degeneration and aging. So tell me what functional neurology is. Uh, we've heard about what functional medicine is. What's functional neurology? 
Functional neurology is a diagnostic value system where a clinician who specializes in it will take a look at the brain and the different networks in the brain and the uh, peripheral nervous system, which are like the nerves that control our, our limbs, and decide what area is working really well and what area isn't working very well. If you, if you imagine a grid that's lit up, there may be aspects of the grid where the lights are a little dim and they're not as bright as the rest of it, and it might not catch the eye of a traditional neurologist who is just looking for power outages, but a functional neurologist will see that dim light, or they might see a light that is burning brighter than the rest of it, and there's this line of connectivity that we can start to see. And what we do is we evaluate the brain and the brain stem, and we triangulate the level of loss of function so we can say, this is the area that we need to stimulate in the brain and the cerebellum or in the peripheral nervous system to get these systems to come back online. I understand you've got some extremely clever ways of assessing this, like the zycotic eye movements or pupil reflex, because these are the weakest muscles in the body. I also understand you can pinpoint exactly what's going on in the brain, and it's important to stimulate the weak parts and to not stimulate the overstimulated parts. Is that correct? Absolutely. And so... Um, I even said stimulate myself, but the reality is, is that it's not just about identifying and stimulating the brain. Some people need the brain to get a break. Some parts of the brain are going undergoing what's called energy-linked excitotoxic changes or transneural degeneration where their whole brain is excited already and it's starting to break down. And so that person, they need a functional neurologist to get in there, identify what the networks are, and modulate them with different activities. So it may not be stimulating. It might be something like, uh, color therapy where you wear glasses that actually reduce stimulus through the eyeball or something like earplugs where you reduce stimulus through sound so that you're not getting too much input into that system. It gives it a breather. But isn't the brain intricately connected with all these other things we're talking about? For example, if there's problems in the cerebellum, it can uh, affect the hypersensitivity to environmental uh, events. Absolutely, and here's, a, here's what can happen. A person can get a concussion or a whiplash injury, and within six hours they can develop leaky gut, and that's all that happened was they had leaky gut. So say that person uh, got into a car accident uh, 30 minutes right after a meal, and the body just didn't have time to digest all that protein, and they developed leaky gut, and that protein went into their blood. Now they have a systemic autoimmune potential reaction or loss of tolerance just due to that car accident. But does it go the other way? A loss of tolerance might show up in a loss of balance in the cerebellum and et cetera. Does it go both ways? Absolutely. There's a condition called cerebellar ataxia, which has been directly linked to gluten. And um, three out of four people with celiac disease, which is a situation where gluten will trigger an autoimmune response in their body, do not even have small intestine issues. It's all neurological or psychiatric, so depression, anxiety, um, schizophrenia, we're finding that a lot of these conditions actually are secondary to inflammation generated in the gut. Wow. So what kind of patient do you typically see in your office? Typically, the type of patient that finds us is somebody that's been to a, a number of different doctors, either in the standard model or in the alternative model, and they've had some progress and they've plateaued and they're looking to get to that next step, or we see some medical mysteries where a person just isn't feeling well in their body, and they've seen a number of doctors, they've spent a lot of money on lab tests and, and different supplements or made different dietary changes, and they still know that an answer is out there. They're looking for somebody to put together their case and, and explain it to them and, and provide some solutions, and uh, those people end up finding their way here as well. Wow. Okay. Um, so w w what other things would you like to add or to well, add I that I might not have asked? Wanna, the biggest thing that I wanted to communicate was that, you know, dietary change is going to be essential for anybody that has a chronic condition. However, that dietary change alone could make them feel better in the short term. Um, if the oral tolerance issue is not solved over time, they could actually become much worse and that they really need to find a practitioner or somewhere, some information that will help them walk through this loss of tolerance, and because that is the key issue. And dietary changes alone actually just aren't going to get it done. That's the main thing I wanted to communicate today. 
So if we go on a paleo diet or a vegan diet, even though these sound so healthy, ultimately they may not be? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our patients are people with autoimmune disease, and they've gone on autoimmune paleo and immediately started feeling worse, okay? And the reason is because they have a loss of tolerance. They start eating more protein, and they're not breaking that protein down well, and they're, they're getting immediate food reactions from it. Wow. Okay. So uh, what I hear in summary that a diet is the first step to remove the, uh, the food that lights our fire, so to speak. But then it's a big systematic uh, puzzle that we have to see what's generating the poor reaction in the gut, what's causing the, um, the poor tolerance of, you know, in the gut, etc. And that's a very complicated puzzle. In closing, uh, could you just add some, you know, summarize in any way you want, and please let us know how we can get in touch with you. Sure. The, uh, the best way to get in touch with us is uh, we have a website, atlas-health.net. Um, our client relation manager, Lindsay, is at contact at atlas-health.net. We also have a Facebook page, Atlas Health, and um, we also have a number you can reach us at 415-459-4411. And um, basically, in summary, loss of oral tolerance is the underlying issue that's going on, food sensitivity. And to correct that will require a lot more than just removing foods. In fact, doing that can make the person worse over time. We have to look at their hormones. We have to look at their thyroid. They have to look at their cortisol. They have to look at their insulin. Um, We need to consider other infections like viruses, um, fungal issues, candida problems, um, other bacterial issues, too much bacteria in the wrong place called SIBO or uh, called commensal bacteria problem in the large intestine. We have to consider autoimmunity to other tissues. We have to consider metabolic breakdowns like diabetes and so on and so forth that are contributing to this. So this oral tolerance issue, it goes much, much, much deeper than just avoiding food. But if a person can get all these variables identified and addressed, there is, there is hope that they can start tolerating more foods and feeling a lot better in their body. And also the oral tolerance issue really is central to longevity and thriving and peak performance. So it's just something to consider, and I wanted to get that concept out there today, and I think we did a good job with that. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I'd like to also add that some of our former speakers like Dr. Houston and Dr. Perlmutter have mentioned that just about anything in the system um, can contribute to some of these diseases. I mean, Dr. Houston says infection and stress and poor sleep and 400 factors can lead to cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's tying in all together that there's so many things that can contribute to our health and optimal wellness that we need to look at them all. So... In closing, I would like people, please do your own research so you can help guide yourself and others toward optimal wellness and be well. Thank you for listening. Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs can be heard live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Here's to better health for you this week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management.